Welcome to the forum on the Butte County Assessor. We're asking the candidates to please abide by the time limitations so that the evening moves along smoothly. Representing the press for this forum are Steve Schoonover no. of the Chief. I'm Laura Ursini oh, with the Enterprise with Record. The Enterprise Record. I'm Thank sorry. you, Laura. Okay. And then we have Asia Sharag Sharaga. Sharaga from the Tico She's News and it. Review. Some information about the Butte County Assessor role. It's a four-year term of office beginning January 7th in 2019. There are no term limits associated with this. The annual salary is 128,688, effective as of October. There are 40 employees in the office. The assessor locates and identifies all taxable property in the county, establishes taxable value for all property subject to property tax, completes the assessment role showing the assessed values of all properties, and applies all legal exemptions. The assessor's office keeps track of ownership changes, maintains maps of parcel boundaries, updates property descriptions and physical characteristics, maintains files of individuals and properties eligible for exemptions and other tax relief, and analyzes trends in sale prices, construction costs, and rents in order to estimate the fair value of assessable property. The assessor does not establish tax rates, calculate tax amounts, or collect taxes. The following offices include assessor, and they will appear on the primary election ballot. A candidate may be elected to the office of assessor if he or she receives the majority of the votes cast at this election, 50% plus one vote. First, let me introduce the candidates. We have Randall Stone. They drew to speak, uh, who speaks first, who speaks second. Mr. Stone will speak first, and Ms. Brown will speak second. The candidates for county assessor um, first have to be certified uh, with a special, which I don't have my notes, a special certification that they must take a test and be certified to be a county assessor. If the candidate who is chosen does not all already have that certification, they have um, up to one year to get that certification and in that time, a temporary assessor is appointed. Am I correct? No? You are incorrect. It's 22 months oh, 22 from months. this election. Yes. Oh, 22 months to get that certification. Correct. Is that correct? Do you agree, Ms. Brown? Use your mic, please. They're issued a temporary certification until they get their their okay. permanent one. Okay. But there there isn't. isn't a temporary appointment. Oh, okay. Correct. Thank you. I got. That's why I don't have my notes with me. Okay. We'll start with a, a one-minute opening statement by Mr. Stone, followed by Ms. Brown, and then we will start taking questions from the audience that have been sent to us up here at the desk, also from the League of Women Voters. It will alternate between the press as well. So, Mr. Stone, you may start. You have one minute. Well, good evening, and thank you all for being here, and thank you to the League for hosting these forums. They're an important part of our uh, democracy and uh, an understanding an, a, a race like the assessor. I've lived in uh, Butte County for the last 24 years. Uh, I'm the husband and partner uh, uh, to Krista, who uh, we've been together for 18 years, and we are raising our four-year-old son, Reese, and our 24-day-old son, Carden. Uh, otherwise, my wife would be here um, uh, uh, tonight, as she typically is. Um, I'm a 14-year owner and operator of a financial uh, planning firm, a, a professional financial management firm, 13 years as a real estate developer, over a decade as a real estate broker. I literally teach this topic at the university uh, to graduating seniors where I uh, obtained a, a bachelor's in, in finance and economics, as well as a master's in public administration focusing on municipal finance and land use policy. I currently serve on the Assessment Appeals Board, which is the arbitrator between taxpayers and the assessor's office. And and uh, I've mentored under the best of the best. My father is the county assessor in Santa Clara County where he's held that job for the last 24 years. Thank you, Ms. Brown, one minute. Thank you. Um, I'm running for assessor merely because I'm not done. I accomplished a lot in my first term, but there's still other things that I want to accomplish and I won't be able to, to get them done by the end of my first term. 
I've been in Butte County for 35 years. I've been married for 39. I have a 36-year-old son and three grandchildren. Um, I've worked for the office for 34 years. I started at the very bottom, worked my way up to the top position, and I believe I still have more to contribute, which is why I'm running again. Thank you. Uh, first question will be one from the League of Women Voters, and we'll start with Mr. Stone. Proposition 13 provides limitations on an increase on a property. What about decreases due to market swings or environmental changes? And the examples given are a fire or the Oroville Dam situation. Uh, fire and calamities, uh, you, you can apply, and I, the assessor's office has just now changed that the application isn't necessary for the fire calamities. It's something that she did accomplish in this last term. Uh, it's low-hanging fruit. And uh, there are opportunities with Prop 8 reductions um, when the market drops. Proposition 13 limits the upward uh, movement of property taxes, but Proposition 8 allows the drop um, below the high water mark. Ms. Brown. Yeah, Prop 13 puts limitations on the increases. Prop 8 um, requires us to lower values when the market drops. During um, the height of the, the recession, we had over 30,000 properties under Prop 8 review. We're down to about 10,000 now because the market has increased. So um, as far as the calamity ordinance goes, we did have the first reading of the ordinance yesterday. What it allows for is on governor declared disasters only. It will allow us to go in and do the calamity relief we need to without the owner having to file a calamity claim. So it allows for a much more efficient process. Thank you. I think now we'll go to the press. Both of you have given reasons on why you're seeking this office. Could you explain further about why you want to be assessor? Uh, right now, we're currently um, converting our mapping system from AutoCAD to GIS. It will actually be a true GIS when we're done. Um, currently, the maps leave our office, go to BCAG, and then come back to the, or go to Chico State, and then come back to the county. I'm trying to make it in a more linear form of delivering information, so we're going to start mapping in, Auto, in uh, GIS instead of AutoCAD, so we can start um, doing adding more layers and providing more information. We're also working on a co uh, project with the recorder's office where instead of um, property owners having to go in and look up their document number, they can just go in and click on a map and every recorded document will be shown on that property. So that's a project that we're planning for the future. Right now I'm currently updating 16,000 files to allow us to more fully utilize our computer system. There was a program that was not purchased by the previous administration that is now available to us for free. So I'm changing records to allow us to do that. Thank you. Mr. Stone. Yes, uh, the reasons I'm running are uh, largely technology deficiencies in the office right now. I mean, GIS is a proposed solution for 2019. Uh, my opponent celebrated uh, adding a refrigerator to the Paradise office as a considerable technology upgrade, and that just, that we're not in the bake sale land at this point. So w we need to work with the state legislature to finance tech upgrades, and that is readily available. Uh, to, to assessor's offices throughout the state. Following the rules, forcing taxpayers to appeal baseless challenges is, is uh, outrageous. And so we need to follow the rules and hold our elected officials accountable. Um, so the level of customer service that we're not providing in these cases is extreme. Um, staffing, there's no uh, weekly or monthly trainings where staff get together and talk about their individual cases. Um, I, I did appreciate, even in today's meeting, the Assessment Appeals Board hearing that there were many more uh, employees present at that. At least it appeared to be um, uh, encouraging training. And eth ethical and managerial failures within the office as well I'd like to fix. Thank you. Now we'll have a question from the League of Women Voters. When an assessment is challenged, what steps are done to assure fairness? Mr. Stone, we start again with you. Uh, it's probably a question of, of the way they are now or the way they're supposed to be. Uh, in March, there was a taxpayer who was came before the Assessment Appeals Board. Again, I'm an, one of the three arbiters in the county. And uh, th there were three rule violations for the assessment. And the taxpayer was not just your average Joe. As it turned out, he was a Sutter County assessor attorney. And he challenged the, the appraisal uh, because it was baseless. And the 
the assessor's office continue to challenge that taxpayer, including restating the challenging and, and in my interpretation, attempting to retry the hearing without contacting the taxpayer for the hearing, which is a violation of due process. I mean, they just could not stand uh, this, this type of behavior. And that's somebody that knew better. The average Joe doesn't know. The average taxpayer doesn't have any idea um, whether they're being overcharged or undercharged and what the appeals process is. We're in, in lush times right now. When those Prop 8s, uh, as the market turns, continue to decline, uh, we will continue to see problems with the staffing in this office. Thank you. The process for appealing a value is the applicant files an appeal, we look at the value, we compare that to um, their value to what we have, we look at comparable sales, and if the value needs to be reduced, we reduce it. Currently, um, since 2007, the, um, there's been almost 5,300 appeals filed. 85% of those were settled by stipulation, 5% were no-shows, so only 10% even made it to the appeals board. The case in point for that Mr. Stone brought up, um, we don't agree with that decision. We believe that they made the decision based on inadmissible evidence and followed a rule that didn't apply. So I stand behind my staff. I stand behind the work they do. I think we do an excellent job, and we follow the rules of the procedures, even if the board doesn't. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Now a question for the Chico News and Review, Mr. Raga. Um, okay, here's my question. Um, for the uninitiated, what exactly is the relationship between what an assessor does and the county's fiscal health? Um, we are responsible for funding 70% of law enforcement and public safety. We are the biggest contributor to, of money to the general fund, which is why the assessor is elected instead of appointed. So we don't have any pressure from administration to raise values when they don't need to be raised or hit a certain target. I'm completely independent of the administrative office and any fiscal responsibilities there. We do our job, whatever happens, happens. We don't base our assessments on what the county, as far as what the county needs for funding. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, I, I could largely agree with that. I mean, that's essentially uh, the way that the process works. However, the assessor's office has nothing to do with revenue. In fact, in the law, in the, in the position, they're supposed to be constitutionally separated so that the assessor is not making decisions of value in order to determine what the public sector uh, police and fire costs are in 70%. It, the 70% funding of the, the general fund, the funding doesn't come from the assessor's office, it comes from the tax collector's office, which is already two steps away from the assessor's office. This, you know, we don't, the assessor's office does not get into questions of, of revenue generation and quite specifically that's, that's not permitted. Thank you. Now a question from the audience, and we'll start with you, Mr. Stone. You don't get a break when there's just two of you, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what happens when I add square footage to my property? Uh, well, if you're going to add square footage to an individual property uh, and a residential property, that doesn't change the, the, the appraisal of the entire property, just the new add-on. So as an example from the, the Assessment Appeals Board hearing, it was at least alleged today that 120 or 130 square feet just magically appeared into, uh, this is not a function of the Assessor's Office, this was uh, a, a case that we were hearing earlier today. And uh, so just that section that was added on would have been, in that case, the 120 or 130 feet would have been reassessed. That wasn't what happened in the Assessor's uh, 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 case earlier today. And I also want to, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Ms. Brown. When square footage is added to a property, we look at the fair market value of what was added. We don't change the assessment on the land or the existing improvements. Then the value of the new construction is added to the existing value. That's pretty much it. Thank you. I think now a question from the league, and we'll start with you, Ms. Brown, after the question is read. There is a marked difference between the county assessor's valuation and online websites like Zillow. Why? That's a really simple question. When, with um, sites like Zillow, everything is added in and averaged. Appraisal is not an average. And so um, there's no way for Zillow to take into consideration things like pools, views, um, all of those kind of things, land, b differences in land, all of those things are settled out in appraisal. 
but in sites like Zillow, it's everything is in, so it, it doesn't matter if your house is a shack or a castle, it all gets thrown into the mix, and a value gets spit out based on just pure square footage. And so the, the subjective qualities of appraisal are not present there, so it's very, very um, easy for Zillow to be a completely different value than our appraised value. Mr. Stone. I, perfect answer. Uh, she's, she's exactly right. Uh, I, I also mentioned my students that are, are using LoopNet and Zillow to report with their assignments uh, the values, and, and, uh, and I explained to them as well exactly that, that, that Zillow is not a reliable uh, resource for, for evaluation. I also want to mention, uh, you know, going back to that case uh, uh, that Ms. Browse mentioned, you know, the Assessment Appeals Board voted unanimously by statute that that appraisal should have never appeared before the Assessment Appeals Board, by statute, unanimously. Okay, thank you. Now we have a question from the audience. And Mr. Stone, after it's read, you'll go first. What are your thoughts on split role and Proposition 60? Perhaps you could give us some background on both of this. Shh. Certainly. Uh, so the split role is splitting residential and commercial properties uh, for Proposition 13 property tax cap purposes. So the suggestion is to eliminate uh, uh, commercial exemptions for Proposition 13, and you're splitting between residential and commercial. It's a revenue generator for property taxes, and I think it's inappropriate for an assessor to, again, be evaluating uh, uh, revenue-based issues. Even though that would directly impact the assessor's office, I. I pledge to staunchly uphold Proposition 13 property tax caps. Ms. Brown? Um, there was a current uh, proposal that's been put off until 2020 um, for a split role for commercial properties to be split out. With that, there was an, an exemption of $500,000 for personal property. That would have wiped out most of my unsecured role. So any gains in value seen by reappraising commercial property were instantly removed but with the, the $500,000 personal property exemption. I think split role is a horrible idea. Once you kick open the door of Prop 13, then residences are, are going to be next. As far as Prop 60 goes, I think the county did the right thing in not allowing inter-county based year transfers. There's also another um, proposal being done by the realtors that would allow a house to be sold like down in Santa Clara County for a million dollars. They come up here, they buy a house for $500,000. Since it's half of their original value, we are only going to, they're going to transfer half of their base year value up to Butte County. It's a losing proposition for Butte County. Thank you. Uh, now a question from the press, if you have one, Ms. Ersney from the Chico Enterprise Record. You both have observed um, actions that have happening in the assessor's office. What do you see that needs to be changed? We have a fairly young staff. Most of my appraisers have been with the office for less than five years. We're still trying to train them. It takes at least a year to train an appraiser before they know what they're doing. They're, the property tax laws are very complicated. There's a lot of exceptions. There's a lot of exclusions. There's a lot of, of complicated and moving parts. And so the biggest thing we need is training. Um, we're not use, utilizing our computer system or tax system in the best way. Um, we're working on that. Um, but I think our biggest issue is training. Thank you. Mr. Stone. Well, I, I think the number one uh, biggest problem in the assessor's office is accountability. Um, when we have these challenges through the AAB and they're not being addressed and continue to, to attempt to, to retry those cases before the AAD, AAB, we have a problem. We have additional problems with campaigning uh, within the assessor's office. The assessor ran uh, my opponent's campaign uh, out of the public office using the, the county telephone number, email, web, physical address resources uh, for the campaign. Um, but training, I, I have to agree, that's one of the first things that I said, and, and uh, training is, is sorely lacking. And one of the big reason, reasons why that staff is so young is because turnover is so high, because we're not in investing in our, our uh, staff. We're not providing them training. We're not providing additional meetings. We're not using our technology, which my opponent just acknowledged as well. Uh, these are the problems, uh, exactly as I've laid them out. And uh, over three years, they have not been improved. We continue to go on a conveyor belt with people that retire after a couple of years. Um, and that solidifies the short-term gains perspective of the, of the director. Sadly, we've run out of time because of extra long break we took. 
So uh, your closing statements should start now. It will start with Ms. Brown. You have one minute for closing. I don't even know where to begin. Let's see. We don't have a problem with accountability um, in our office. We, I have, I get more letters of compliment from my staff than I do complaints. We hear biggest complaints from other departments. We do need to train our staff, but um, we also need to have appeal board members that are fair. We need to have fair hearings there. We need to have um, accountability in the assessment appeals board and have them follow the actual law. Um, I believe that I still have more to contribute to the office, and as long as I have the support of my staff and the respect of my staff, then I will continue to seek this office. Thank you. Mr. Stone. You know, I've laid out um, some pretty specific objectives as to what I'd like to see change in the assessor's office. I'm, I'm glad that some of that is being taken up immediately by my opponent. Um, but we've got a long way to go, and, uh, and we have significant accountability problems. Uh, surprisingly, with the Assessment Appeals Board, uh, my opponent attempted to remove uh, people for political reasons without, um, uh, for claims of false bias, when every decision by the AAB so far has been unanimous, and the chair of that, that body was the, the, uh, the person who attempted to, to control that out. So we've got accountability and, and uh, impostorship uh, through the, the uh, Assessment Appeals Board, complete and complicit by the, the assessor's office. So again, we need accountability, we need technology improvements, we need customer service, we need training, um, and we need to stop the turnover and the bleeding of staff uh, in the office. And it's, it's just um, it's ethical and managerial failures. This is not a job that defends the, the appeals before the Assessment Appeals Board. It is a management job, and that's where we're failing. More information about these and other candidates throughout the state can be found on the League of Women Voters Edge website. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Butte County and BCAC-TV, we want to thank the candidates for participating in the forum this evening and thank our audience. You may now applaud. Thank you.